We've come to think of 1860 as the beginning of the saga of Indians in South Africa, but deeper research into our history has set that date some two centuries earlier. To tease apart the myths, misunderstandings and actual facts, we approached sociologist and historian Professor Ashwin Desai for some background. Zaki had arranged to meet Ashwin at one of his favourite Durban haunts. An avid reader and researcher, Ashwin has, both in his own right and in collaboration with fellow academic Professor Gulam Vahid, authored a number of books chronicling the early Indian experience in South Africa. Their latest work has a particular focus on the story of indenture. Hello, Ashwin! Great to see you. It's so good to see you. I can't wait to chat today. When I was younger, my parents taught us a lot about South African history, including how Indians came to be in South Africa. And that's why I'm so excited to chat to Ashwin. How did this mammoth task of writing this book come about? Well, it's a story that had to be told. And one of the challenges for historians is to take stuff out of the archives and bring it alive to a reading audience. And once we got into the archives, looked at the letters, looked at the court records, we understood that indenture was an epic African journey that continues into the present. I would love to see the book. Let's go. Ashwin, what inspired Inside Indian Indenture? From my mother's lap. She always told me stories, where she came from, the life they lived, and I always wanted to dig back further and further. It must have been quite a journey of discovery. Every day in the archives, a new revelation, a new inspiration and I felt like a child. I just wanted to be back in the archives, looking at more files, telling more stories. It made me think about their lives in new ways because the system, remember, wanted to turn them into numbers, a people of history, a people who didn't know where they came from. And every day, they changed that and confronted that and turned themselves into real living human beings with a past and a future, trying to have a culture that they could hang on to to survive a system that was a new form of slavery. Ashwin, for you, what are the most memorable stories? The one of people who never made it. They came across in the ship, but because of the situation on the ship and the circumstances in which they found themselves, many died of malnutrition and some were imprisoned on the ship. And one of them was a woman called Munyama. And she was chained, she had messed herself, she wasn't allowed out of her cell. And eventually, one of the indentured just heard a sound in the water. And either she had escaped and committed suicide because of the humiliation and the oppression, or she was pushed overboard by the captain or one of the sailors on the ship. She'll just be a footnote in history. What we do in our research is try and retrace her story by going through the court records of the case that was held in Durban. And of course, once the case was held, nobody was found responsible for the death of Munyama. And she stands in for so many of the unknown indentured. What were the conditions like on the ships? It was a kind of prison where the indentured were given a meager diet and any infraction that the captain felt he would deal with it incredibly harshly. So there was a thing where a woman would have a placard around her saying, I'm a pig, or a potato was shoved into somebody's mouth and they had to walk around the ship. And the Laskers often exploited women on the ship who were defenseless. On the other hand, the ship became a place in which the indentured started to build a new community. In many cases, the indentured called the ships the Temple of Jagannath. Because remember that there were different castes, people from different villages. And sometimes a Brahmin said, I won't eat from a hand of an untouchable. And people said, well, you have to eat because here there's no caste. We're all in the same situation. We're all indentured, we have a number. And if we don't unite together, we will die. And what were they promised or what did they expect? A completely new life, a life where they would be defended by a legal contract which would give them enough money to survive. And if they didn't want to go back, a piece of land in Africa. So the promise was a labor contract. When they arrived, that labor contract was meaningless. How has going through this journey affected you? Well, on a personal level, it's changed my life. I thought I knew the story, but in reading back into the archives, one starts to think about many things. One needs to think about the position of women in society, 
today people are talking about the oppression of women, the woman's places in the home and so on. And I want to go back and tell them, well, there were women who came alone here and built lives and they had that kind of strength. There are people who are still talking about caste, but they couldn't be caste amongst the intention because for every five men you had have one woman. And if you didn't marry that woman, you'd never marry in your life. There were, there were gay relationships amongst men and yet today the community wants to deny those kinds of things. So for me history is not only about the past, it's how you read it into the present circumstance. And therefore the story of indenture is a real living story because it instructs us, it, it makes us rethink all the prejudices we have in the present. And so when people even talk about racism and people being inferior or, or, or superior and so on, go back to the story of indenture and see how how people were treated there and think whether you want to be part of a system that treats people in similar ways. I can't believe that my history is actually between these two covers. Well, let's go and <laughs> uncover it. <laughs> you have a chapter called When the Coolies Made Christmas. <laughs> what is that about? Well, that's, that's an incredibly interesting story. The only time they were allowed off plantations or the railways was to celebrate Moharam and the whites call it Kuli Christmas and it was three days. And no matter what religion you were, you came into the center of the city, you had tazias, you had floats, and people almost divided up into gangs where they competed with each other. And it was the only time indentured met other indentured. So you can imagine, sometimes people hadn't seen each other from four or five years since the time they were separated on the shore would meet once a year. What about religious and cultural expressions? This was one of the most powerful things of indenture. When we wanted to understand how the indentured survived in an atmosphere of semi-slavery, they built small temples, mosques, churches. And these not only became places where people went to pray, but they became community centers. And out of these temples were small schools. And out of schools, the indenture demanded that the children learn English because many already knew they were never going back to India. And if they were going to make it in the white man's economy, then their children had to have an education to be able to read and write. Ashwin, you not only have a collection of amazing stories, but you also have awesome imagery. One particular photograph is just about six mug shots of indentured, their faces, all men, just their numbers. That's as they arrived on shore and they were basically being told, you have no history. And one of the powerful and moving things for Gulam Fahed and I was to trace back those numbers and give those indentured names once more. Another one is of a woman just after the 1913 strike and her husband had been shot dead. And there she looking into the camera with her daughter. And I always wondered in the 1913 strike, what happened to her, but what happened to her daughter and what kind of lives they had. Because if your husband wasn't working on the plantation, you would be put out of the plantation. And there weren't the kinds of social networks that could have helped somebody like this. The other is of the Monigado family who walked from Dar es Salaam to Nkuse. And there's a photograph of him and his wife and his children staring into the camera, thinking we're back in Africa. But most of them were repatriated back to India and we don't hear about them again. And so we bring these photographs alive in the book and in a photographic book called Many Lives. Is it correct to think that 1860 is when the first Indians arrived in South Africa? At one level, indenture did start in 1860 but they were Indians arrived as slaves in the 1700s to Cape Town. Little is known about them. In a way, your question belies something even deeper because they struggle around identity. But some days they'll be referred to as Malays, then coloreds, and then South African Muslims. So we see very early on how people trying to react to identities that were imposed upon them by the British and Dutch authorities. Ashwin, what are some of the most important missing links of our history that should be filled? There's so much to be written about the Indian community to the ordinary teachers and doctors and lawyers who did so much to weld this community as a defensive mode, not to be rolled over, but also as an offensive mode to confront the strictures of apartheid. Ashwin, thank you so much for sharing these big stories with me. Oh, thanks for the big <laughs> hug. <laughs> there are so many details missing from our amazing history and I'm so lucky to have stolen some time with Ashwin to shed some light on them.